And welcome back to the truck. This is a continuation of the previous uh, words from an old truck. We're talking about eulogy. Eulogy, which is an old Greek word for good news. When you... Uh, You show up at a funeral, usually you don't think good news. But that's exactly what you should be hearing when you come to someone who is a believer's eulogy. The good news. <clears throat> Peace that passes all understanding. Why? Why good news, though? Is it really good news? I mean... What about hell? What about fire? What about God burning his enemies? Is that what it's all about? God burning his enemies? Let's go to the Sermon on the Mount, for instance. You show up on the sermon, show up on the mount where Jesus teaches that uh, you should forgive those who despitefully use you, who wrong you, who ask you to go a mile and you go two with them, who steal your coat and you give them your cloak also. You have all these things that God says you should do, but we don't think God does. God forgives his enemies. God forgives those who wrongs him. It's an interesting thing to think that God is not held to the same standard that humanity is held to. Jesus preaches a law that is beyond the law. Because in the law it says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If someone wrongs you, wrong them back. And then ask for forgiveness. Bring the proper sacrifice. Then your forgiveness shall be made perfect. But what if Christ, what if Jesus is perfection? What if Jesus himself is everything? What if this is all about Christ Jesus? But maybe you've heard Christ preached incorrectly. Maybe you've heard Christ preached in a way that makes him seem like less than God. Perhaps you've heard Christ preached as the whipping boy of God. Jesus is just some human that God beats up that God crucifies, that God's a, he allows to be beaten with stripes so they can heal you. Maybe God is just some jerk in the sky that's beating up on one of his kids so he doesn't have to burn all the rest of his kids. You hear my dog? His name's Theo. He's still young and he's kind of stupid. He finds the perfect time to howl and bark for no apparent reason. But he knows his dad's in the truck. And he loves my truck. He loves to drive with me. He is my ride or die. He loves being in this truck. And if I was to open this door right now, he'd jump in here. You know what? I think I will. Hang on a minute. Watch this. Theo. Look here. Come on. Come on, boy. Come here. No, come here. Give me a kiss. Theo. Are you wet? It's been raining. Come here. Give me a kiss. You love me? Are you my boy? <laughs> this is Theo, everybody. 
Are you supposed to be in the truck? Daddy's trying to teach. Huh? Oh, come on. Come on, get out. Come here. Come on. Uh, you gotta get out. Come on. Get out. Come on. Go play with Chrissy. There you go. Yeah. I have one dog named Christology. We call her Chrissy. And another dog named Theology. And we call him Theo. That was Theo. The importance of having a correct Christology and the importance of having a correct theology are tantamount to having a happy life. If you don't have a correct Christology, if you don't have a correct theology, you will be a miserable Christian. You will constantly look for ways to make God happy. Because, you know, God's pissed off at you. Because, I mean, he had to beat the crap out of Jesus even to look at you, right? Or did he? Or is God Jesus? Or is Jesus Christ God? Because if Jesus Christ is not God, then you are not saved. You are not forgiven. And you have no place in the kingdom of God. Interesting, right? These ideals that we hold ourselves to, these forgive and you shall be forgivens that we hold ourselves to. These faults, and let me say it again, false ideals that we hold ourselves to and not God to prove that we trust ourselves with our salvation more than we trust Jesus Christ, who is himself salvation. That might hit a little hard. That might hit a little deep. That might be a little upsetting for some. I don't really care. Good. I hope that upsets you. Because if that upsets you, then you really want what God has for you. You really want Jesus. Because really, there's nothing else. Jesus Christ is all, in all, and through all. There is nothing else. Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the ending. We place such importance on ourselves. We think that somehow, some way, our decision for Christ, our prayer, for becoming something outweighs what Jesus Christ himself has done. The passion of Christ Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection outweighs humanity. Outweighs humanity. If there were scales in which our goodness and evil were weighed upon when we went and stood before the judge of all creation, there would be a Jesus on one side and all of flesh and life 
on the other side. And it would still be outweighing on Jesus' side. There is nothing but Christ. There is nothing more than Christ. There is no other than Christ. There is no power but Christ. It is all Christ. But you might say, but what a free will. How's that working out for you? How's that free will working out for you? That free will doing you well so far? You chose your parents, right? Choose your siblings. Did you choose those in whom you were in contact with when you were a child? Were you hurt, molested, broken, destroyed? You choose that? Your free will choose those things for you? Mine didn't. The interesting part about this world is there are all kinds of free wills and they are all overlapping. They are always and continuously interfering with that of the other. So what should God do? Should he impinge upon that free will? Stop all evil. Break all choices and make everything good? Or should he knowingly allow what we consider evil to bring about the ultimate redemption, to bring about perfection in those who would choose better and those who would knowingly release that free will to one who was chosen for them, knowing that Christ is the chosen one on behalf of all humanity, knowing that Christ himself is God and man, bringing everything into perfection. What should we do? Do we let go of what we think is control? Do we let go of what we think is perfection? Do we truly trust whether it's in our relationships whether it's in our hearts whether it's in our own minds our thoughts do we truly trust and release these things to the one who is salvation not will I said my prayer And bless God, I'm saved. Well, I did what I was told to do, and I got dunked in the water, and bless God, I'm going to heaven. Do we let go of all of that and trust that Jesus Christ as our best interests at heart? Or do we trust in ourselves? Do we trust in ourselves? Or do we trust in Jesus? Do we trust in our prayers? Or do we trust in Jesus? 
Because faith is not something you can do. You can't get more faith. You can't get enough faith. Well, if you just have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou casteth into the sea. That was just a point that Jesus was making. Because none of them had faith. None of them trusted him. None of them was going to say, You know what, Jesus? I trust you. Hey, mountain! Get into the sea. He's simply trying to drive home a point. Which nobody got. Not Judas. Not Peter. Not Matthew. Not Mark. Nobody. Nobody got his point. His point was, you're all faithless. Nobody has any idea what's going on. I'm going to the cross. But why was he going to the cross? Why did he need to have himself stuck to the cross? Was it because his dad said so? Let's check that out. Jesus said, and I quote, I do nothing without seeing my father do it first. What does that say? Oh, that says my father is on the cross and he's waiting for me. I am being led just like I was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. I'm being led to the cross to where my father is waiting for me. So I can be like my father. I can show the world who my father is. And my father is cruciformity. Cruciformed nature. He bows to the whims. To the thoughts. To the desires of his creation. And he always has. Jesus went to the cross because the Jews wanted him crucified. Because Pilate was gutless. And Barabbas needed to be saved. The murderer needed to be set free. The one who was guilty needed to be cleared of his guilt. We who deserved crucifixion received crucifixion vicariously with him. He died our death. He was buried in our grave. And he was resurrected with our resurrection. The substitutionary theory that has been brought in to make Jesus look like God's whipping boy. The penal substitutionary theory is not only false, it is harmful. It makes Jesus not God, not part of the Trinity, but some scapegoat, some other that can be destroyed on behalf of humanity. But it was God who was in Christ, reconciling himself to the world. It was Jesus knowingly doing as his father would do. 
and allowing his creation to do what they would want to do, which is snuff out the light because we loved darkness. And so many of us still love darkness. We don't want to be told we're good. And religion has really helped with that. Because religion says, mm, you're evil. You're wrong. You're bad. You're no good. You're horrible. You are a sinner. And there is no good thing in you. But Jesus says, you look like my father. I think I'll bow to your will. You look like my dad. Have your way with me, Father. Have your way with me, Father. And while we failed miserably in representing who we truly are, we accomplished exactly what the Father needed to accomplish, which is the full representation of the unseen God. He wanted us to know that he bows to us and he does not require sacrifice. He is not the one that needs blood, but we are. He is not the one that needed blood. And he never was. He does not require child sacrifice. And he never did. And he proved that throughout the ages. Whether it be Abraham, Christ, or your own children. He never needed blood. The love of God has shown us that we should live meekly in grace and peace. He has come and taught us all that we should bow to the will of our Father and knowingly release our will to His. The goodness of God, the grace of God, their names coincide with the very one crucified, Jesus Christ. His teachings might have confused you, thinking that there was some way to live up to his standard. But it was his actions on the cross when he forgave his enemies. God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, I will drink this hyssop filled with vinegar. I will release my spirit to you, Father, because I trust you. Going down into Hades, to the abode of the dead, releasing them all of their chains. Even his broken apostle, Judas, meeting him again face to face, seeing and releasing him from his guilt, his shame knowing that he's not who he thought he was. But he is who Father God, who Papa says he is. A lost coin, 
a lost sheep, a lost son, never lose their value. Never lose their value. Whether it be the son of perdition or not, he never lost his value. The main point that I'm trying to drive out here is it's not about you. Or at least, should I say, it's not about who you think you are. The name your mama gave you or your daddy gave you or your grandpa gave you. Your last name, your middle name, your first name. You have one name. You have one father. There is one faith. There is one baptism. There is one God. And father of us all. We think that it depends upon us to make it into heaven when Jesus Christ himself has placed heaven on the inside of you. If sin was in everyone before the cross, if all had sinned and come short of the glory of God, as everyone loves to quote that verse from Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of a God. And according to Corinthians, Jesus Christ became sin so that those who knew no sin might be made the righteousness of God in him. If sin was in everyone and Jesus Christ became sin, then where is Jesus Christ? You can't say it, can you? I'll say it for you. He is in every one. Regardless of their will or their choice or their desire. Just like sin was there, regardless of your choice or your desires of your whims of what you wanted. Jesus Christ is there. It is the revelation of Jesus in each person that is our job to preach the eulogion, which is the good news, which is, hey, I bet you didn't know it, but Jesus Christ is in you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can respond, you can ignore But you can't run him off. You can't get rid of someone who takes up all of the space. Who takes up every single atom, neutron, proton, all of the quantum space and quarks. He is in everything. Jesus. It's all about him. Isn't that exciting? If it's not exciting, I'm sorry that you're so miserable. If it is exciting, (laughs) isn't that awesome? Jesus is awesome, right? He's got this thing sewed up. We're so terrified we might be (gasps) left behind. He can no longer... He could no more leave himself behind than he could forget us. We will 